Hey, we are in the, the midst of our sermon series that kind of accompanies our season of compassion. Season of compassion, if you don't know, is this uh, kind of tradition that we have here at Celebration. We take the five weeks from the Sunday before Thanksgiving through the Sunday before Christmas, and we just sort of do a deep dive into showing the love of God, the compassion of God to others. We believe that's very, very important. And we're going to dig in today, and we're going to talk about kind of why that is, why we believe that's so important, and it's going to lead us to do some doctrinal work today. I hope you're ready for a little bit of doctrine. It's going to be great. Uh, so we're going to be looking at a ton of scripture. If you're that person and, and you church for you is when you go through verse after verse after verse, hey, today's your day. It's going to be your jam. Uh, we're going to look at a lot of different texts today. Beginning, by the way, in Genesis chapter 12. So if you want to open your Bible to Genesis 12, that would be great. And go ahead and do that. If you don't have a paper Bible with you and you'd like to follow along, you can uh, go to your uh, device, get your device out, and follow along on a, in a Bible app if you have one. If not, uh, go to your app store and download our church app, Celebration Baptist, dot, uh, Baptist Church, no dot, uh, in the search bar. And you'll find our church app, and there's a Bible feature there. You can use it to follow along, okay? So let's go ahead and let's get started with a word of prayer, and then we're going to dive in. Lord, thank you very much for the chance that you've given us to be together. What a blessing that it is. And we just pray, Lord, that as we spend this time with one another, uh, that we're just doing really investing into our life with you. Help us to learn from you today. We recognize your word is powerful. We recognize and celebrate that it is true. And we hope to be changed by it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, I do want to thank you all for making the last weekend, uh, Family Night of Thanksgiving in particular, so incredibly special. So last Sunday night, uh, several hundred of us got together back here on the, in the field, and we worshiped together, we prayed together, and it reminded me of being a, a kid uh, when our, my little local church would have a, an outdoor event, an outdoor gathering, and all the parents, would, adults would sort of be over here, and all the kids would be over here kind of running around, and it was kind of, you know, disorganized chaos a little bit for the kids, and we had that last week. It was oh, so much fun, and uh, it was neat to see the kids just having a great time and families praying together. Uh, and I want to say thanks to everybody who volunteered to make that occur. Uh, those fires had to be made and fire pits had to be put into place and chairs had to be set up and stage had to be set up and sound and the volunteers who served in, in leading worship, all of that hard labor. Uh, it was just incredible to see it all come together. I so appreciate everybody who volunteered. And then we, uh, you, you, all, you all know, you all brought food. We had uh, 460 families worth of food purchased. We needed 425 which was up from 275 the year prior so you all just destroyed the goal it was amazing and that's enough food to serve over 2,000 people, so that's pretty remarkable. Uh, and then, uh, so <laughs> after the, the Family Night of Thanksgiving event, a bunch of you, and I mean a whole bunch of you, came to the gym and helped pack. And we were like ready for like 30 packers, and like 80 of you were in the room. It was awesome to see. And you guys made short work of getting all that ready. And then on Monday, we had law enforcement uh, officers from 10 different agencies, about 70 to 80 law enforcement officers who've come. This is our third or fourth year doing that with them, and they do our deliveries. And it was really, really cool to see. So I came up uh, while that was being done on Monday, and I walk in, and one of our lead volunteers is there, and he's standing there with a law enforcement officer. And I kind of see him over there, and the, the law enforcement officer, he's, he's a little choked up, you know? And so I walk over and kind of join in on the conversation. And the guy had been out. He had four deliveries to make, and he made his deliveries, and one of them didn't work out. You know, the person wasn't home, that kind of thing. And we get a handful of those each season of compassion. It's just part of it. And, uh, and our guy, we've got a system to handle all of that. But he had come back to return that box of food. And he's standing there and he says, I went to make this one delivery. And I knock on the door and this elderly woman comes to the door. And he said, I got the box. And he said, I tell her, I said, I've got this here for you for Thanksgiving. And she's excited, and she kind of opens the door, and we stand there, and we're visiting. And he said, these three little kids come up. And he said, I'm guessing grandkids. And he said, I'm standing there, and I'm going through the box, just telling her what's in it. And he said, I came to the part 
where I told her about chickens being in there. Now, let me just let me put in a little bookmark right here, okay? We're going to just push hold on this story, tell another story, and then come back to this story. Are you guys good with that? Are you okay? All right, so why chickens, you ask? Okay, turkeys have been really hard to come by, especially in quantity. So when we went to our vendor and said, hey, could you give us 450 turkeys? They said, absolutely not. We can't. No, we can't give you that many. And so we had to go to a different vendor. And they said, all we've got is 18 to 20 pound turkeys. That's all we can give you in any kind of quantity. And can we agree, that's a whole lot of turkey meat. Okay, that is enough tryptophan to put you asleep for a month. Okay, so we did not need turkeys for every family. We needed something smaller. So we said, well, can you get chickens for us? And they said, sure. Well, this is a commercial food vendor. And commercial food vendors, I learned, sell chickens in 50-pound sacks. They're not individually wrapped. So on Sunday, we've got a group of volunteers up here out in refrigerated trailers with food service gloves on sorting chickens. And I see these guys, and I thank them for being here. And I thought, you guys had no idea when you woke up Sunday morning that by Sunday afternoon you would be sorting chickens for Jesus. You did not see that coming. <laughs> so anyway, they're working really hard. That's why we got chickens. Fast forward back to the story. Are you all with me? The officer's standing there. The woman is standing there. Her three grandkids are standing there. And he's going through the box. He said, and there's chickens in here for you guys too. And he said, one of the little girls, when he said there's chickens in the box, started jumping up and down and said, we're going to have chicken to eat. And he said, it hit me at that moment that this little girl was celebrating because they were going to have meat to eat at Thanksgiving. And he said, it just blew me away when I saw that. And when he became connected with what was going on, it really moved him. And so he's telling the story, the guy that I'm with, I'm there. The guy, the law enforcement officer's there. And he's all choked up as he's telling it. And the guy that I'm with, the, the lead volunteer, he gets all choked up as he's telling it. And I get all choked up as he's telling it. And so you just have three crying dudes, <laughs> one of them with a gun and a badge, all standing around crying by the chickens. It was quite a sight. It really was. But you all, what made that moment so special for him was, was what? It was the connection, right? And it occurred to me in that moment as I stood there in that little circle of men, that connection is essential for compassion. If, if you will, compassion is fueled by connection. The two are inseparable. You see, the word compassion literally means to stoop down onto someone else's level. Imagine getting down to your, on a knee with a child, looking them eye to eye, seeing the world through their perspective. That's the definition of the word compassion. And so when I see somebody in distress, if, if I look at them in the eye, if I get down and I'm looking at the world through their eyes, okay, then I begin to understand their problem, their challenge, whatever it is they're facing. If I'm angry with someone because they have sinned against me and, and my anger is righteous, okay, if I show compassion when I get down and I see the world through their eyes. I try to understand the problem, what, what went wrong. I try to understand it through their eyes. That, that is what compassion is. And the stronger the connection between us, the better and more able compassion is to flow. And if you go to the Bible, you see this. You see the idea that compassion is all about connection. And God himself is this, this most beautiful, most perfect picture of compassion. He's the author of compassion. And so it's no surprise that if you look, you see that God is involved with, if you will, connected to humanity from the very beginning. And that's the source of where all of his compassion comes from. If you look at the Old Testament, Genesis chapters 1 and 2, you see this creation story, and God creates the heavens and the earth, and then he creates Adam and Eve, and he makes them in his own image. Can you get any more connected than that? Is that not powerful to think about? And God is so connected to Adam and Eve that we learn in Genesis that he would walk with them in the cool of the evening through the Garden of Eden. Eden, can you imagine that kind of connectedness with God? What a beautiful reality. And if you keep reading in the book of Genesis, chapters 3 through 11, tell us the story of the downfall of humanity. People turned their back on God in spite of his connection to them, in spite of his compassion for them. 
But God does not give up on humanity. His investment is too great. His connection is too great. His compassion is simply too strong. And you come to Genesis chapter 12, and God sees a world that has rejected him, but God doesn't reject humanity. Instead, what does he do? He invites humanity into a covenant relationship with him, a greater sense of connection. And he does so through one man, a man named Abraham. Look at it in Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. The Lord said to Abraham, go from your land, your relatives, and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. So God speaks to Abraham. Abraham hears from God, and Abraham does exactly what God says. He follows through. He trusts God, and he follows him, and he relocates his family. And God gets to work building a nation through Abraham and his wife, Sarah, even though they are in their elderly folks. Doesn't matter, God goes to work and he starts building a nation. Now here's the thing, if you start with just one family and you go to work building a nation, it's gonna take some time. And so centuries go by. Abraham's family winds up immigrating all the way to Egypt and they grow into a nation. They become so numerous that the people of Egypt are actually afraid of them. And so they enslave the Hebrew people. And God sees what's going on, he is completely aware He has this deep, abiding connection with them. And so God reacts and responds. And he raises up a leader, a guy named Moses. And through this leader, he brings the people of Israel, his people. He brings them out of Egypt with all kinds of signs and wonders and miracles. And it's a powerful thing. And he leads his people across the Red Sea. And he wipes out the Egyptian army. And he leads them to Mount Sinai. And there... They meet before God. Can you imagine this would be not a powerful time? It's incredible, right, what is going on. And at Mount Sinai, the covenant that God had offered to his people is made official. Look at what God says, Exodus 19, verse 4. You have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you will carefully listen to me and keep my covenant, you will be my own possession out of all the peoples, although the whole earth is mine, and you will be my kingdom of priests and my holy nation. Then look at verse 8. Then all the people responded together, we will do all the Lord has spoken. And so a few days later, God meets with his people. He descends on the mountain. He gives them the Ten Commandments. It's the foundation of what it means to be in a relationship with a holy God. It's another powerful moment. And the first and foremost, the first commandment given was that they were to worship God alone. And all of the people of of Israel, the Hebrew people, they're all agreeing that this relationship should happen. And they're saying, we will do exactly what you have told us to do. And it all sounds so great. But if you keep reading the Bible, you learn that just 40 days later, think about that, just 40 days later, Israel makes a golden calf, an idol, and they bow down and worship it just 40 days later. How many of y'all have ever been betrayed before? You don't have to raise your hand. Ever been betrayed before? Ever been betrayed by somebody that you thought you could trust? Maybe somebody who made a commitment to you? Somebody who made a pledge to you? Remember how that moment felt? Some of you might be thinking, dude, I am working through some betrayal right now, even as we speak. As you think about that person who betrayed you, think about some of the emotions you felt when that betrayal occurred. <laughs> and your, your emotions, depending on who you are and how you're wired and your personality, you may have ranged for everything from, I just want to punch them in the face, right? I mean, there was anger and there was frustration And there was rage and there was heartbreak. Remember those feelings? Now imagine in God's situation, he invites the people of Israel into a covenant relationship with him, a deeper connection they could have ever imagined. And they betray him just 40 days later. How would you feel if you were God? Would there be some rage? (laughs) Would there be some anger? Yeah, you would think so. Look at Exodus 32 verse 9. The Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people... And they are indeed a stiff-necked people. If God calls you stiff-necked, that is not a good thing. Okay? Verse 10. Now leave me alone, look at this, so that my anger can burn against them and I can destroy them. 
Then I'll make you into a great nation. God is so angry. And his attitude is, man, I could just start over right now with you. We just wipe the slate clean here. You know what that is? That is rage. And that is heartbreak. God says, I want to wipe these people out. And if you've ever been betrayed, you get that moment. But here's what we need to understand. Even though God could have done that thing, that is not who God is. God's character is different than that. See, God had just entered into a covenant relationship with these people, and God follows through. He keeps his word. And the connection brings about compassion. So God comes to Moses, and they meet in just this incredible way. Look at Exodus 34, verse 6. The Lord passed in front of him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord is a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger and abounding in faithful love and truth, maintaining faithful love to a thousand generations, forgiving iniquity, rebellion, and sin. So just think about this for a moment. In the face of this incredible betrayal, God says, Moses, do you know who I really am? Do you know who I really am? I am God. I am the Lord. And above all else, I am compassionate. I understand what my people are going through. I get who they are. And I am gracious, meaning he does things, good things for us that we do not deserve. And I am slow to anger, meaning he is patient with people. Aren't you glad that God is slow to anger, by the way? Now just think about the power of that reality for a moment. And he says, he is abounding in love. God's love is love that you can rely on when you can't rely on anybody else's. And he is abounding in truth, what God says is reliable. You can take it to the bank. And the, God, and the Bible goes on to celebrate God's compassion over and over and over again. It just fills the pages of Scripture. I look, for example, at Psalm 103, beginning in verse 7. He revealed his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in faithful love. He will not always accuse us or be angry forever. He has not dealt with us as our sins deserve or repaid us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his faithful love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far he has removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. Mm. And for you and me, the compassion of God is this unimaginable blessing, is it not? I mean, are you not delighted that God shows you compassion? I don't know about you, but I am so thankful that when God sees me, he is slow to anger. I am so thankful that when God sees me, he is quick to help. He's quick to heal. He's quick to restore. And God cares about me. And he shows me his compassion day after day after day. Lamentations 3, 22. Because of the Lord's faithful love, we do not perish, for his mercies never end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. And God's compassion is not limited to just forgiving our sin. It's way more than that. God cares about those who are hurting Deuteronomy 10, 18, he executes justice for the fatherless and the widow and loves the resident alien, giving him food and clothing. And you look at it time and time again through Scripture, and we could look at verse after verse after verse. It all echoes the same truth that God is compassionate. You say, David, that's not all God is, and that's absolutely true. Is God all powerful? Absolutely. Is God all present? Absolutely. Is God all knowing? You'd better believe it, absolutely. Is God righteous? Absolutely. Is he a righteous judge? Absolutely. Is God compassionate? Absolutely. He really, really is. So our all-powerful, all-knowing, ever-present, perfectly righteous God cares deeply about you, and he cares deeply about me, and he cares deeply about the poor and the foreigner and the widow and the fatherless and the orphan. That's who God is. I told you we were going to do a little bit of theology today. Now, what does this, what does this mean for you and me? I mean, how, how do we live in light of the reality 
of who our amazing, wonderful, compassionate God is. Well, if you're a Christ follower, you all, this throws down just a massive, massive challenge for you and me. Okay? Let me show you this little verse. This little verse just, maybe it strikes a little bit of terror into your heart. Therefore, be imitators of God as dearly loved children. Now just let that verse soak in on you for just a moment. Just consider those words. You and I are to be imitators of God. That's a big piece of what it means to be a Christ follower. And if you're a Christ follower, you're a child of God. You're to imitate your father. And God is a, uh, is a God of great compassion, so that means that we are to be people of what? Great compassion. We can't be imitators of God if we don't imitate God in his compassion. Can't be done. And so it's incumbent on us to show great compassion ourselves because God himself is greatly compassionate. Now, if you look at Scripture, you see this truth over and over again. Leviticus 19, 34. You will regard the alien who resides with you as the native born among you. You are to love him as yourself, for you are aliens in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Psalm 10, 14. But you yourselves have seen trouble and grief, grief observing it in order to, uh, to take the matter into your own hands. The helpless one entrusts himself to you. You are a helper of the fatherless. So this idea in Scripture is there over and over again that God is compassionate and that's his character and you and I are to imitate him by being compassionate. So here we are. Fast forward to today. And we're in the midst of something we call the season of compassion. And the whole idea is that every five weeks we set aside this time as kind of an just espresso shot of compassion into our hearts so that we can show the compassion of our Heavenly Father to the people around us. And y'all, it's just a mandatory part of what it means to be a Christ follower. But let me ask you this. Is it easy to show compassion to other people? Is it easy if, if compassion means that I stoop down to someone else's level and I see the world kind of through their eyes, is that easy to do? I would submit it's not easy to do. If it was easy, we'd see a whole lot of different behaviors in our world today. We'd see a lot more compassionate people, would we not? Showing compassion is really difficult, and it occurs to me that there are a lot of barriers that prevent us from showing compassion and you, if you were here, you could probably make your own list of what those barriers are. But as I think this through, two barriers just, that I see in my own life just jumped out at me. And maybe you see these barriers in your life. For me, I think first and foremost, one of the greatest barriers there is for me in showing compassion is the, the barrier of indifference. Frankly, you all, so often I just don't see when people are hurting. I just, I'm the guy that I, I get very focused in what I'm doing. I get very focused in what I'm, what I'm thinking about. I get very focused in my own tasks, my own responsibilities. And I'm the kind of guy that can just blow right by somebody, right? And kind of not even see the person in great need. It's just so easy for me to do that. I'm just indifferent sometimes. And I really appreciate my wife because my wife is so the exact opposite. I don't know for how many of you all this is true. You know, like one member of the, of the, you know, of the couple is like the really sensitive one and the other one is, is not terribly sensitive at all. And that's me and Pam. And Pam is incredibly and wonderfully sensitive. And Pam will go, do you realize you just, root, you know, just blew right by that person of great need? Do you realize you didn't, you didn't even slow down? Now you go slow down and you go back there and you be compassionate. I am so thankful. You know how God uses your spouse to, as a great discipling tool in your life. I'm so grateful for my wife in that way. And so I've had to just learn to appreciate, and I'm still learning to appreciate, the fact that my tendency is to be indifferent to the needs of other people. So, easy example. When you pull up at the traffic light over in front of Bass Pro Shops, there's always somebody there at the corner, right? Sign in hand always somebody right there at that intersection. My tendency is to pretend that I have blinders on, right, and that I'm deeply fascinated by the bumper sticker on the car in front of me. 
And I don't even see this guy or his sign standing right there. You know what I'm talking about? That's my tendency. That's what comes naturally for me. And so if I'm going to demonstrate the compassion of God, I've got to train myself to lose the indifference and to just to plan ahead and to think a little bit differently because I desperately want to be able to look that guy in the eye just like I should be wanting to look everybody in the eye. And I've got to deal with my indifference. So this week, here's what I want you to do. This week, slow down and look at people through the eyes of compassion, okay? Just don't give yourself the opportunity to be indifferent. So when you see the person stand at the street corner and your natural reaction is go, you see that guy, honey, that guy should get a job because I've worked for everything that I have and see what I have, I have all of this. If that guy would get a job, he could be just like me. I am just offended by his need. Don't give yourself the chance to go there. Just don't. Look at the world through his eyes and just ask yourself for a moment, what would it be like to spend Thursday afternoon standing by this street corner? And just look at it a little bit differently. Maybe for you, that indifference comes to forgiveness. Hmm. And somebody has done something to you, and your righteous indignation is righteous. They deserve your wrath. But aren't you glad that God has chosen to be compassionate to us? Aren't you glad that he's slow to anger? And so when you encounter that person this week, slow down. And set aside the indifference and just say to yourself, I'm going to look at this person with great compassion. That's what I'm going to do. And just make a choice to live a little differently. And you'll overcome that barrier of indifference. There's another barrier that I see. It's at work in my own life, and I see it in, just, just in general in the lives of a lot of folk. And that is the barrier of division. <laughs> Are we not just a deeply divided people right now? As a country, we've talked about it a lot in church. People are separated by their views on, like, everything right now. I mean, people can't agree on much. People are separated by their views on race. People are separated by their views on politics, on their views of education, on their views on COVID response, you name it. People are divided, and that, that division is bitter, and it's intense, and we have all seen it just playing out on our big screens and small screens, you name it, we've seen it. And how do we respond to that? What, if, if I'm going to be a person who reflects the compassion of God to others, if that's what I'm supposed to do, how do I deal with that within the context of all the division? Let me just give you a, a kind of a simple idea here. Instead of seeing people by all that divides us, just sort of view the world as, if you will, two categories of people, okay? First category is family. Okay, I got to hang out with my family all this week. It was a lot of fun. Uh, we went over to Jackson, uh, Jacksonville. My sister lives over there, a little town called Middleburg, and her three adult kids and all their siblings and all of their kids. And you all, they are so much fun. I wish all of y'all could just come to Thanksgiving with me. You would enjoy this family immensely. They are just so much fun. So we're in the car, and we're on our way to see my family over there. And as we're driving along I-10, and we all know how exciting and stimulating the drive between here and Jackson, Jacksonville really is. So we're on that drive. Pam and I are talking, because what else are you going to do on that drive? And we're talking, and my wife says, you know, I absolutely love hanging out with your family. And, you know, that just made me feel so great, right? And I said, I'm so glad that you like. She said, you know, they are the easiest people to be around. And I said, yeah, I agree. They're pretty good folks. And then she says, you know why I like hanging out with your family so much? Why they're so easy to be around? I said, why? And she said, because when I'm around your family, I can relax and just be myself. Isn't that fantastic? Okay. Now, I've got my family. You've got your family. I hope that was your experience over Thanksgiving. Now, think about who else is in my family. What does the Bible teach me about the people sitting in this room, your church? What does the Bible teach us? The Bible teaches us that this is our family, right? 
my church is my family. And you all, I've talked about this over the years an awful lot. You know how my family, my church rather, became my family when I was a kid growing up. They stepped in and they helped raise me. And you've all heard that story so many times you could tell it probably better than I could. Okay? But you all are my family too. And it's true. When we look at Scripture, that's the image that we're given. The church was a family, right? I mean, take a look, if you would, Acts chapter 2, verse 42. Talking about the church. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and signs were being performed through the apostles. Now all the believers were together and held all things in common. You all, is that not a fabulous description of family? Is that not a wonderful description of what family's supposed to be? So when I look at the world and I recognize that I'm in this world in which we are all deeply divided, the first, if you will, category of people that I need to see is I've got this family. And I've got the family that I'm born with, the wonderful people over in Jacksonville and others. I've got the family I'm born with, and then I've got the family that I am blessed with. And that is you all, the church of Jesus Christ. And so when I come across someone who is a Christ follower, and I am tended, or my inclination is to be divided from them, I need to stop for a moment and just think, that, that's my family. And we may have a, a point of disagreement here, but I'm going to keep that in the right place, and I'm going to relate to them as my brother or as my sister. I'm not going to just be divided from them. Does that make sense? So I got this one category, I got family. What's the next category then that I've got? If I've got family, who else do I also have? I got my neighbors, okay? I can think of everybody who's not yet in the church of Jesus Christ as my neighbor. Now, if you think about it, Mark chapter 12, what does Jesus say that we are to do with our neighbors? He says that we are to love our neighbors as what? ourselves. And Jesus said, hey, this is a great suggestion. I would encourage you to follow it whenever you feel like it. Is that what he says? No, it's not a suggestion. What is it? It is a command. It is a command. Now, here's the thing. God decides what is right and wrong. We decide to obey or disobey. That's ours. When God gives us a command, then what do we do? Well, we should follow it. Okay, that's clearly the expectation. So here's what I want you to do this week. Okay, when you're out and about and you encounter somebody who is a fellow Christ follower, you treat them like family. But when you meet somebody who has a completely different value set, they're not yet a part of the body of Christ, okay? And you know they don't know Jesus. And they say things that just kind of rake you over the coals. You know, it's just, okay? When you see that person coming, Here's what I want you to think in your mind as you see them coming. And you feel that first little bit of uh, angst coming up in your heart. In your mind, just say, as you see them walking toward you, just say, hey, neighbor. Let's practice it right now, okay? Everybody, hey, neighbor. Just think that in your mind. And as they come near you, what have you done? You've given yourself a point of connection with that person. And when you're connected with somebody, compassion is a whole lot easier to demonstrate. And so you see that person that gets on your nerves, man. We are different. We have different views. But I'm going to extend compassion to that person. I'm going to see the world through their eyes, and I'm going to show them the love of God because that's what my Father in heaven has commanded me to do. You get it? Do you see how important compassion is? I told you that today was going to be a challenge as we began today, right? Just imagine, though, what happens to your family if you began to relate to others in your family with compassion. If you thought, man, that uncle, that aunt, that cousin, that nephew, that brother, that sister, that mother, that child absolutely drives me crazy. But I'm going to do my best to see the world through their eyes. And I extend to them some compassion. Imagine the impact that has on your family. What does it mean for your church? If we all extend compassion to one another, 
if we all manage to move past indifference and we look at the people who are sitting in this room and others as our church family and we get over our indifference, we don't just blow by, we see the need and we see the world through their eyes and we treat them like family. What happens in your workplace if you don't allow yourself to be just divided by every different idea and thought, but instead you look at your coworkers and you go, hey neighbor, and when you say it, you just think, I'm going to be obedient to God, even if it kills me. I'm going to be compassionate. I'm going to show the love of Christ. I'm going to love my neighbor as myself. Can you imagine the impact that that would have on the world in which you live every single day? All right? So can you do that this week? I'm going to set aside indifference. I'm going to set aside division. And I'm going to show the compassion of Jesus Christ this week. One more little thing here. If you're here today and you have never considered the compassion of God, if you have no idea what it means to be loved by a heavenly Father, I want you to know that he is inviting you into a close and intimate and personal relationship with him right now. That invitation is good right now. And your heavenly father would say to you, come to me, I will forgive you of your sin, I will put your path, your feet on a path that is straight, I will renew you, I will refresh you, I will make you know, and I will adopt you into my family. And if you've never experienced that, let's talk together today when we're done. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Thank you so much for your compassion. Thank you that your mercies never end. They are new every single day. And you call us, Lord, you command us to imitate you. And if we're going to imitate you, then that means we've got to be people of great compassion just as you are. So, Lord, as we are indifferent, forgive us. Help us to see the world through the eyes of those that we encounter. And, Father, where we are divided, and as that interferes with our uh, capacity to imitate you and show compassion, forgive us. Help us to see the world as those who are part of our family through Christ or those who are our neighbors who desperately need to know Christ. Thank you, Father, for loving us and for showing us compassion every single day. For your mercies are good and they are new every morning. We pray this in the great name of Jesus Christ. And everyone agreed and said, Amen. Amen.